a group of... Uh, we'll return to order. And uh, we're now going to receive testimony from our second panel of witnesses. I thank you for your patience and, and waiting uh, while we had the first panel testify and answer questions. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to introduce our panelists all at once, and then we'll start again uh, with Mr. Schwartz at the beginning for testimony. Marshall Schwartz is a specialist in defense acquisitions at the Congressional Research Service. Before joining the Congressional Research Service, he served as a senior analyst at the Government Accountability Office and as an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn, New York. He received his BA from Yeshiva University as well as a JD from Yeshiva University's Benjamin N. Cardoza School of Law, an MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business, and a Master's in Public Policy Management from Carnegie Mellon's H. John Hines III School of Public Policy Management. Kyle Forsberg is a research analyst at the Institute for the Study of War, where he focuses on the security dynamics and politics of southern Afghanistan. Previously, he worked at the Marine Corps Intelligence Headquarters and for a Ugandan State Minister for Disaster Relief and Refugees in Kampala, Uganda. He holds a BA in history from Yale University. Colonel T.X. Hamas, did I say that right, sir? Thank you. Uh, is retired United States Marine Corps Colonel and an expert in United States military strategy. He is currently a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. He has also served at all levels in the operating fo forces to include command of a rifle company, an intelligence company, and the Chemical Biological Incident Response Force. He's the author of The Sling and the Stone on War in the 21st Century and numerous articles and opinion pieces. Colonel Hannes is currently pursuing a PhD in modern history at Oxford University. Dr. S. Frederick Starr is the founding chairman of John Hopkins University's Central Asian Caucasus Institute. He's an expert in Afghanistan, Central Asia, and the Caucasus, Russia, and the former Soviet Union. Over the course of his career, Dr. Starr has authored or edited 20 books and more than 200 articles on Russian and Eurasian affairs. He received his doctorate from Princeton University in history. So thank you all for making time available for us and for sharing your substantial expertise. Again, it's the policy of the subcommittee to swear you in before you testify, so I ask that you please stand and raise your right hand. And do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So thank you. Let the record please reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We will put your written testimony as well into the uh, record, uh, so you needn't read it in its entirety. You could summarize it in about five minutes for us, uh, remembering that the, the light goes amber when you have about a minute left. It goes red when you're out of time. And then we just hope that you'll wind it up. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Schwartz, you're recognized. Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Defense's use of private security contractors in Afghanistan. According to the Department of Defense, as of March 2010, there were over 110,000 contractors and almost 80,000 troops working for DOD in Afghanistan. Contractors made up 59% of the total DOD workforce. Over 16,000 of these contractors in Afghanistan were armed private security contractor personnel. Over the last three quarters, the number of armed security contractor personnel increased four times faster than that of troops in Afghanistan. Since December 2009, there have been more armed security contractor personnel working for DOD in Afghanistan than in Iraq. Contractor personnel risk death and injury at the hands of insurgents in Afghanistan. According to DOD, from June 2009 to April 2010, 260 security contractor personnel working for DOD have been killed in Afghanistan, compared to 324 U.S. troops. Adjusting for the difference in the number of PSC personnel compared to troops, PSC employees working for DOD are four and a half times more likely to be killed than uniform personnel. More contractor personnel, 188 people, were killed providing convoy security than any other type of security. Regardless of how one analyzes the number of armed contractors working for DOD, PSCs play a critical role in U.S. efforts in Afghanistan. Many observers have pointed out that the extent of DOD's reliance on PSCs and other contractors was not planned and was ex executed without a clear strategy, exacerbating the risks inherent in using armed contractors on the battlefield. This unprecedented reliance on PSCs raises some fundamental questions. First. What are the benefits and risks of using PSCs in military operations? Two, to what extent should contractors be used in contingency operations? And three, what can be done to ensure that DOD improves its planning for the use of contractors in future operations? 
PSCs can provide significant operational benefits to the U.S. government. They can be hired and released quickly, allowing agencies to adapt to changing environments. Contractors can possess skills that the government workforce lacks, such as knowledge of the terrain, culture, and language of the region. According to many analysts, both DOD and the Department of State would be unable to execute their missions in Iraq and Afghanistan without PSCs. According to these analysts, the risk of not using PSCs is nothing short of depriving DOD of the resources it needs to succeed in its mission. There have been reports of local nationals being abused and mistreated by PSCs working for the U.S. government. Such incidents continue to be reported in Afghanistan, and unlike Iraq, where many of these incidents involve contractors who are U.S. citizens, in Afghanistan, many of the guards causing the problems are reportedly Afghans. The question can be asked, is the problem that DOD is using contractors to perform the critical function of armed security, or is the problem that DOD is not sufficiently managing contractors and holding them accountable? For analysts who believe that armed security should not be contracted out, options include increasing the size of the military, rethinking current force structure, or choosing not to engage in certain contingency operations. For those who believe that the problem is insufficient planning and poor management, the solution may be to develop an effective strategy for using PSEs, improving operational planning, and enhancing oversight. DOD has taken steps to improve its management of PSEs. According to many analysts, these efforts have improved the management oversight and coordination of PSEs. At the same time, many analysts maintain that more needs to be done. The extent to which DOD plans for the use of contractors in the future can help ensure that DOD puts a more effective management system in place. Such planning could ensure that contractors are used to improve overall operational effectiveness and not because DOD unexpectedly had insufficient military personnel to perform critical functions. This opinion was expressed in 2008 by a colonel who was responsible for overseeing PSCs in Iraq. While discussing efforts to improve contract management, he stated that the question is not what DOD is doing to fix the problem now. Rather, he stated, the real question is why DOD was not thinking about this issue 10 years ago when steps could have been taken to avoid the situation we are in today. This raises another question, namely, is DOD assessing when and to what extent security contractors and even contractors in general should be used in future military operations? Some analysts argue that DOD missed an opportunity to address the issue in the 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review. Despite not being included in the QDR, DOD has begun to examine the issue. DOD has set up a task force to examine the extent to which it relies on contractors and to use the analysis to plan for future operations and to help plan DOD's future force structure. The task force has already briefed the most senior levels of the department. A number of analysts believe that this effort is a step in the right direction. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, this concludes my testimony. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you to discuss these issues. I'll be pleased to respond to any questions that you might have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Schwartz, and we will have some questions, and so I appreciate you, you being here for that. Mr. Forsborg, if you'd please, five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon on the issue of the host nation trucking contract. I'm honored to testify on a subject of great significance for our campaign in Afghanistan, and I appreciate the Chairman and the Committee's leadership on this pressing question. I want to address today the strategic context of contracts like the host nation trucking contract to highlight their implications for the U.S. campaign to degrade and defeat the Taliban and to leave behind an enduring Afghan government. The chief strategic concern with current contracting practices is that private security companies in Afghanistan tend to subcontract to or pay predatory Afghan militias that further the ends of the power brokers who own them, often at the expense of enduring stability. To understand why this is such a concern, it is helpful to remember that winning a counterinsurgency fight is largely a question of establishing the legitimacy of a government. Lack of government legitimacy is, after all, the root cause of an insurgency, and if the Afghan government were widely viewed as legitimate, we would not be fighting the current campaign. The Afghan government has lost considerable standing by forming alliances since 2001 with factional actors, included, including predatory warlords and their militias. Afghan leaders at many levels have taken sides in local disputes and alienated significant elements of the Afghan population. 
It is noteworthy that the Taliban rose to power in southern Afghanistan in 1994 because the population there deeply resented the behavior of militia commanders. Some of the very same commanders the Taliban expelled with popular support back then are now directly or indirectly operating on ISAF contracts. Kandahar province, the focus of ISAF's insurgency efforts this summer, offers a prime example of how ISAF contracting practices have inadvertently supported small cliques of government-affiliated commanders. Ahmed Wali Karzai, the half-brother of President Hamid Karzai and the chairman of the Kandahar Provincial Council, has close links with a number of Kandahar's key private security and militia commanders. Several of these commanders control key logistics routes and are heavily relied upon by almost all the host nation trucking companies operating in southern Afghanistan. Ahmed Wali Karzai has used his connections to the Afghan government and to ISAF to build this network and in some cases to influence in the awarding of contracts to his own allies. It is notable that one of the major private security companies in Kandahar, Watan Risk Management, is owned by cousins of the Karzai brothers as was until recently another group, Asia Security Group. These militias significantly outnumber the Afghan police force in Kandahar city. The army and police force thus find themselves competing with private security companies especially when it comes to recruitment. For the population, meanwhile, the government is in essence seen as an exclusive and predatory oligarchy. It must be kept in mind, ultimately, that ISAF has not created the militias that exist throughout Afghanistan. These militias were largely the product of the anti-Soviet resistance and the civil war of the 1990s. That said, ISAF contracts have made these militias far more lucrative and cutting these militias off from the indirect benefits of U.S. contracts will be a necessary step in dismantling their influence and replacing them with the Afghan army and police. This step cannot be taken completely and immediately, however. What is needed is a careful strategy to unwind the contracts, find gainful employment for the foot soldiers, and ensure that ISAF or the Afghan army and police are available to fill the security demands that contractors are now fulfilling. The issue of illegal militias in Afghanistan is challenging, but it is one that, the, that ISAF can solve. The U.S. troop surge has given the United States and its ISAF allies resources to reform and investigate its contracting practices. ISAF has already begun standing up structures for reviewing and reforming contracting, including Joint Task Force 2010. Having additional boots in the ground is providing ISAF with a surge of intelligence on how contracting networks in Afghanistan operate and gives ISAF more options in providing oversight for these problems. The U.S. does have leverage at this point over the militias and local commanders who subcontract from the coalition. Once ISAF organizations like Joint Task Force 2010 have understood the complex networks by which, sub, uh, by which contracts support militias, these contracts can be restructured in ways that account for the dynamics of local Afghan politics. ISAF has announced its intentions to do this, although the details of its plans are naturally still vague. But because the problem of Ill illegitimate militias is more than a problem with ISAF's own contracting practices, reforming contracting should be part of a broader campaign to identify Afghan militias and to eventually disarm and disband these groups, and once their command and control structures are severed, to integrate them into the Afghan National Army. In conclusion, Current contracting practices are problematic and play into large trends that undermine the legitimacy of the Afghan government. But the situation can be addressed. The recent increase in U.S. force levels has given our commanders the resources to reform the oversight and management of its contract in practices, and this will be a crucial step for the U.S. counterinsurgency mission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Flake, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to address you this afternoon. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Forsberg. Uh, Colonel, if you'd like. Chairman Turney, Ranking Member Flank, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to appear today. Mr. Schwartz has provided a comprehensive view of the current status, so I will not attempt to duplicate his work. Instead, I would like to briefly discuss the good, the bad, and the key question about using contractors in combat zones. The good, the primary value of private contractors is that they replace troops. Further, they can mobilize and deploy large numbers of personnel very quickly, and as soon as a crisis is resolved, they can be immobilized. Another critical advantage is contractors may be able to do jobs that U.S. forces simply can't. In Afghanistan, we lack the forces to provide security for our primary supply line to Pakistan. And if history is any guide, 
Even a heavy presence of U.S. troops would not guarantee the delivery of supplies. Fortunately, Afghan contractors have the mix of force, personal connections, and negotiating skills to do so. The bad. When serving in a counterinsurgency, contractors create problems from the tactical to the strategic level. Three are particularly important. The first, quality control, is a well-publicized issue that DOD has worked to resolve. Yet even if DOD enacts all planned reforms, how exactly does one determine the military qualifications of an individual, much less a group such as personnel security detail, before hiring them? We need to acknowledge we have no truly effective control over the quality of the personnel hired as armed contractors. The second issue compounds the problem of the first. The government does not control the contractor's daily contact with the population. Nothing short of having qualified U.S. government personnel accompanying and in command of every contractor detail will provide that control. We do not accompany the Afghan security companies that escort the supply convoys throughout Afghanistan, and thus we have no idea what they're doing with the population. The lack of quality and tactical control greatly increases the impact of the third major problem. The United States is held responsible for everything the contractors do or fail to do. Despite the fact that we have no effective quality or operational control, we pass the authority to use deadly force in the name of the United States to each armed contractor. Since insurgency is simply a competition for legitimacy between the government and the insurgents, this factor elevates the issue of quality and tactical control to the strategic level. There are also a number of indirect consequences of, em of employing armed contractors. First, it opens the door for local organizations to build militias under the cover of being a security contractor. Major General Nick Carter, Commander NATO Region Command South, has noted warlords in Kandahar have been allowed to build militias that they claim were private security companies. In addition, private security companies compete directly with the host nation's attempts to retain military and police personnel. In 2010, Major General Michael Ward stated Afghan police were deserting in large numbers for the better pay and working conditions associated with private companies. And that leads us to the key question. Contractors clearly have a number of direct strategic level impacts on counterinsurgency operations. The most important are the reduction of the political capital necessary to commit U.S. forces to war, the impacts on the legitimacy of the counterinsurgency effort, and the perceived morality of that effort. Both proponents and opponents admit the U.S. would have required much greater mobilization to support Iraq or Afghanistan without contractors. Thus, we are able to conduct both wars with much less domestic, domestic political discourse. But is this a good idea? Should it be easier to take this nation to war? Along the same lines, we should ask, is it a good idea to pass authority to use the deadly force in the name of the United States to people we don't know? Should we hire poor third world nationals to sustain casualties for us? Any examination of the U.S. use of contractors must conclude they undercut the legitimacy and morality of our efforts in counterinsurgency. Given the central role legitimacy and morality play in counterinsurgency, it's essential we ask the real question. Is it strategically a good idea to use contractors in combat zones? While it's too late to debate this question for our current conflicts, it is essential we make it a critical part of our post-Afghanistan force structure discussions. The size and type of force we build for the future depends upon the answer. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members, that concludes my testimony. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Colonel. Dr. Starr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Flake, I... Is your microphone on, sir? Now it is. Thank you. I have nothing to add to the various interventions regarding the tactics of contracting. Well, then it's a wrap and we'll start again. No. <laughs> <laughs> However, I would like to suggest that none of these will, will uh, affect the bigger picture of the mission, fate of the mission in Afghanistan. And let me, let me get to this point by a, a, kind of, a couple of simple questions. Why do we need so much protection along the roads? Well, the answer is obvious, because there are Taliban forces and other criminal groups floating about. Second, why do they move about so freely? Again, answer is obvious, because the population at large is totally passive. It is indifferent to this. It, and then, why are they not engaged in the protection of their roads? 
Uh, well, because they don't see any benefit from the roads being open. These are being opened for transport of U.S. military equipment, not for the transport of their local crops, their local products, let alone for regional transport, let alone for continental transport from which they could richly benefit. So they're spectators. Uh, and beyond that, of course, uh, you, you might no note that, that that the defeat of the Taliban and and uh, the crippling of Al Qaeda are, are perceived as our objectives. Uh, they don't see where our objectives mes mesh with their personal objectives, which is economic betterment. So let me raise the question: What kind of strategy uh, would work? What it, what is needed? Well. Obviously, an economic strategy, and both Presidents Bush and Obama have, have spoken about that. We have a lot of economic projects. We don't have a strategy. If, uh, what, kind of, what would meet that criterion for us? Uh, what are the criteria that must be met for such a strategy? Well, I would say there are three or four. Uh, first of all, it has to benefit locals. If they don't see a benefit from it, they're going to be neutral or opposed to anything we do, including transport. Second, it must uh, support our military effort, and it has to go simultaneously with it. Third, it has to be able to provide an income stream for the government. We're paying all Afghan civil service salaries today. That isn't a sustainable arrangement. And finally, it has to work fast. Now, the only strategy that meets such, a, such criteria, the only one that I'm aware of, is exactly the subject that we're discussing today, transport and trade. I would submit this is a much more important hearing, even than has been suggested by our very uh, competent previous uh, uh, speakers. Uh, what, do I, what do we mean? We're talking about opening up local channels of trade for local trade. We're talking about regional channels of trade, uh, Afghanistan and its immediate neighbors. And we're also talking about the great continental trade routes that literally go from Hangburg to Hanoi, uh, 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 connect Europe and the Indian subcontinent. The, this potentially is a money machine. Once it starts to flow at the most local level, everyone will take advantage of it. You don't have to advertise it. Everyone will know. And they will become the defenders of the open road rather than the passive observers or worse. Now, you can, say, you can say, well, aren't we doing this anyway with the Northern Distribution Network and so on? Yes, we're doing fantastic stuff in transportation, whatever the problems are, and they're serious. Nonetheless, it's a major achievement. Yet we have no plan for engaging the local economies in this. We have no plan for opening this to local, local shippers, local, local producers, farmers, and so on. We have no exit strand plan, no transition plan on this to privatize, if you will, civilianize these transport routes. And therefore, there everyone is skeptical or opposed. Now, what is needed? It, it, very simply, the un United States needs to adopt this as, as a fundamental strategy, as, as, as on the par with its military strategy, because without this, the military strategy will not succeed. And uh, one might say, well, isn't this very expensive? Aren't you talking about building masses of roads? But we've heard from several of, of, uh, of the congressmen today that, in fact, the biggest impediment are, are actually bureaucratic and, and, and people impose, imposing the long delays at borders and these sorts of things. It's a managerial problem. It's not an infrastructure problem fundamentally. And beyond that, let me say that this bigger development I'm talking about is being actively promoted by, by well, all the major international banks, especially Asia Development Bank, ECO, World Bank, and so on. Also by China, India, Pakistan, Iran, all the Central Asian countries, Saudi Arabia, Japan, and so forth. In other words, this is happening. What I am speaking about is going to break through. Whether The question is whether the U.S. Is, is savvy enough to put itself at the head of this, to be the coordinator and convener for the effort that opens the cork, which Afghanistan now presents at, to the system as a whole. If we do, I think we are on the road to success in Afghanistan. If we don't, all the efforts, commendable suggestions that have been made here with regard to transport will be for naught.
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Th thank all of you. It's great food for thought. Uh, let me start, if I might, with, with Mr. Schwartz. When you count the contractors, the armed contractors in a the theater, um, is there any way you can actually count the, the people that might be part of uh, one of the commander's militia if they're not registered, or do we just assume that it's whatever number you count plus a whole lot more people who are unregistered working as militia uh, forces? There have been questions raised as to the ability to accurately count that, and the Department of Defense has acknowledged that difficulty. The easiest segments to count are, of course, U.S. nationals and third country nationals, particularly those that need permission to come in and get arming authority for the PSCs that are properly regulated. Um, but it is n no question, uh, many people have raised, including DOD, as I said, the issue of the ability to accurately count private security contractor personnel that are working for local militias beyond Kabul for sure. Thank you. Uh, has uh, CSR or anybody that you know done an analysis uh, comparing the risk of, of using, uh, or I should say the risk of not using private security contractors uh, in a, a counterinsurgency sort of situation against the risk of using them but not managing and overseeing them properly? I'm not familiar of a particular study that analyzes specifically Afghanistan beyond what uh, some of the other people here on the panel have discussed, but there have been concerns expressed by people in uniform over there in Afghanistan that some of the events that are occurring are, in fact, making their mission much more difficult. Thank you. Mr. Forsberg, uh, Ahmad Wali Karzai, in your research and your work, have you heard uh, recent contemplations that he might be behind or somehow connected with a desire to have a Kandahar security operation where they consolidate a number of the different um, people that have been adding security to the southern area so far? There have been several media reports to that extent reporting uh, Dexter Filkins has done several, several of these pieces. Uh, if you look at Ahmed Wali Karzai's connections, um, there are linkages between him and some of the figures involved in the Kandahar Security Force, including uh, Commander Rahula. is reporting that Minister Atmar had asked Ahmed Wali Karzai uh, to take a role in uh, achieving the formation of the Kandahar Security Force. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dr. Starr, I've got to ask you this. If, if I'm hearing you right, are you saying that the United States strategy would be better served if we took our military forces and use them to protect the transportation lines and that that could open up a whole host of other possibilities over there as opposed to uh, paying off warlords or others but to use our forces and concentrate them on keeping those transportation lines free and then using it for the regional, local and, uh, and continental trade? Yes, sir. The, the keeping open, the opening and maintenance of the transportation corridors should be a high strategic objective. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Colonel, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, sir, if you take the figures on the GDP in Afghanistan are disputed, but if you take the $13 billion here, Afghanistan has a GDP of $500 per person. If we were wildly successful and in 10 years doubled that, they would still be poorer than today's Chad. Chad is not a functioning state. I don't see in 10 years making Afghanistan a functioning state based on a doubling of the uh, economy of the country. And that's even with, say, Dr. Stiles' program being successful or whatever, it would still be a problem, you think? Sir, I think uh, the ability to double the economy of the country is a pretty significant accomplishment in 10 years period. You've got to go to 7 uh, With the reduction in drug trade, you have to grow about 10 percent a year. Oh, to get to poorer than today's chat, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, if I may say, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Korea at a certain point was almost at the level of, of Afghanistan today. We persisted. We, we pursued prudent uh, market-based economic policies, and look what happened, not only in the economy but in the governmental structures. I, I think the possibilities are well beyond anything suggested here. And those aren't my conclusions. They're the conclusions of the Asian Development Bank. They're the conclusions of, of, of a uh, half dozen serious studies that have been done by national governments before they've invested in these uh, critical uh, infrastructure issues. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Thank you. Mr. Schwartz, um, given the current 
structure that we have for these contracts. Um, is it possible uh, for the Department of Defense to manage or supervise these, these contracts the way that uh, the law requires them to do? Thank you for that question. Um, a lot of people have actually done a lot of good in-depth analysis into that, including the Government Accountability Office, the Special Inspector Generals, uh, as well as the Commission of Wartime Contracting. And while they have all expressed that DOD has made progress, they have also generally expressed that there is a lot to be done. Um, a number of them have come up with specific options and recommendations that they believe can definitely have an impact and a lot of them are out there. I'll just mention a couple that have been thrown out by various people. Um, one is, as a result of Nisor Square, that event with Blackwater uh, about three years ago in Iraq, the Kennedy Commission, which was published by the State Department, required, based on a recommendation, I'm, I apologize, from the Kennedy Report, to have a U.S. government personnel go along with every convoy of State Department. Some analysts have recommended that that would be useful for the Department of Defense is to make sure that every time there's a large convoy to go out. That's one option that has been uh, mentioned there. Another option uh, that has been mentioned is to do uh, in-depth analysis of who is being hired. So the general view of many of uh, the people who have looked in depth in this is that progress can be made. Mr. Forsberg. I, I tried to get in the last panel, and I understand I wasn't going to get much of a policy response from them, but at what point does it become counterproductive to a coin strategy to have the kind of activity that has been found uh, in this report? Um, what level is acceptable uh, to still have an effective uh, counterinsurgency strategy, to have a, a parallel structure of authority uh, outside mm -hmm. of the, the Afghan government? Right. Thank you, Congressman. As I said, this is a very serious problem, and I think the goal needs to be to reduce it as much as possible. Um, the issue, of course, is that while we've weighed the costs of this system, we also have to, we also have to weigh uh, the benefits. Uh, and so it would require as well looking at you know, how hard it would be to move these logistics without the current system. But it is clear that the current system is counterproductive. And even though in the short term we may have to con continue to tolerate uh, the reliance on these militia commanders, I think it's imperative, because this is such a fundamental driver of the insurgency, that we have a long-term strategy to shift away from the current model, uh, because the current model is, uh, it is a key factor that undermines the Afghan government's legitimacy. Dr. Hamas, how, how likely is it that we can move away from this model? I mean, these, these warlords uh, and the, the militias that they control are likely uh, making as much money as, as they would as part of the Afghan security forces, uh, either the police or the, the, uh, the military. What, how, how likely is it, in your view, uh, that, that we can make this shift? So I think it would be very unlikely. The people who gain power from this are not going to voluntarily give it up. So they would have to be integrated in some kind of negotiated deal. Uh, in the mid-80s, when insurgents were good guys, I was seconded to the agency and was helping with the Afghan task force. The Soviets needed to push a 4,000-truck convoy to Kandahar or they were going to lose Kandahar. They attempted to fight its way through with multiple regiments of armored troops and could not. They struck a deal with the tribes and rented an opening of the road for a certain period of time. Money was paid, convoy through, then the road was closed behind them. So it's a matter of Afghan skill of negotiation plus contacts plus the willingness to fight. It is not a military solvable problem without a very large force structure. Well, some on this panel have suggested that we have leverage uh, to make this happen. Do we have that leverage, in your view? Sufficient leverage to, to uh, I mean, we control the contracts. We, we can so pay money or we can't. But. I'm not an expert on our relationships with the various groups, but there's a huge problem here in terms of the internal dynamics that we would have to understand to the Afghan level, the internal dynamics to make the negotiations appropriate on the various road sections, and then have to dismantle the current military organizations that have been built to do this unless we can co-opt them by bringing them on side. And of course, to break them up and put them in the armed forces, they don't look as co-option but loss. Right. Dr. Starr, you talk about the importance of trade routes and having the 
necessary infrastructure to enable that. Uh, if we play a greater role in creating that infrastructure, don't we still have the same problem protecting it? No. No, because what we have now is, first, U.S. government state trade, basically our moving our goods around. Uh, you don't have pri the, the kind of serious private trade that I'm speaking of. No, and it, when you do have the beginnings of it, it's highly localized, which feeds exactly the situation we've been talking about, local bosses. Once you have longer, longer uh, 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 strings of trade uh, connecting secondary market, uh, remote people to secondary markets, secondary to primary markets, you have people way down the line with, a, with exerting pressure to keep this particular problematic section open. You don't have that today. We have a conflictual model. It's basically the U.S. versus all kinds of good and bad some very bad private interests there. This is an alternative model in, wh in which we actually are opening up channels for the uh, for trade in which, in which you actually uh, uh, create an entirely different incentive structure, uh, not just for the traders, as I've emphasized, but also for the public, which becomes the, the actively engaged in keeping the roads open, as indeed a few cases they've been actively engaged in keeping schools open. Now, this isn't, this isn't utopian. Uh, uh, let me just say, this is the policy of the Afghan government right now. They, they would love to see us engage in this. This has been presented to General Petraeus' staff and the people at CENTCOM in the last two weeks. They were very, very uh, positive about the ideas, as indicated in the published report. Uh, I, I think this is fast gaining traction as, as essential. And, and by the way, it's very relevant just as we get involved with this project in Kandahar. You look on the map over here. What uh, int isn't shown is is the uh, new Pakistan uh, Pakistani port at Gwadar. Now Gwadar is a clear shot from Kandahar, and and but never in our eight nine years in Afghanistan have we o uh, made a priority of linking that immediate port with with the ring road that uh, via Kandahar. Now this does two things. If it, it were we in arriving in Kandahar to say, within the next three weeks, you're going to be able to get a truck from here to, Ka to Karachi port, uh, I'm sorry, Gwadar port, uh, 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 with no more than six or eight hour uh, at the cross border crossing. If we were to do that, we would so juggle the incentives, not just in Kandahar, but in the Taliban stronghold of Quetta, we'd transform the economic situation. The incentives would be different. You'd have new actors. You'd have old actors taking up new roles and so on. Now, this is ours for the taking. I mean, we are there. We are in the catbird seat right now. We can make this happen. If we choose not to, it will eventually happen without us, uh, but unfortunately not to the benefit of our mission. Thank you. That's interesting. The, uh, Colonel Hammes, let me, let me ask you again. I, I, you are a former military commander. You've done just about everything there is to do from the ground on up, so I, I put this question to you. Uh, if you were still a military commander at, uh, in this theater, how would you feel about knowing that a convoy of pickup trucks and SUVs, SUVs with mounted uh, Dishka anti-aircraft machine guns mounted on them were rolling through your battle space? accompanied by a guard force of 400 men with AK-47s and RPGs firing at villages in an attempt to intimidate pot potential attackers? Sir, obviously this is a contradiction of coin approach, uh, but I think currently it's rooted in necessity. If you don't let them, you have no supplies. And I think that's the problem we built for ourselves. Uh, Mushi's figures indicate about 15,000 armed contractors doing this job. That would require more than a division, more U.S. troops, which of course then means you need more convoys. So you would consume your entire plus up for Afghanistan in providing supplies to get through. When you choose to fight a battle where your lines of communication run through territories that have been challenged since Alexander fought his way out of Afghanistan, it is hard to envision a way to resupply that other than making deals with the locals. 
Well, Mr. Forsberg talks about transitioning out of that model to uh, a different and better model. Can you foresee an example of that? It would be very difficult and take a long time, sir. And how do you envision, Mr. Forsberg, that, that what, to what do we transition and how do we get there, do you think? Right. I think, Congressman, the first step is to uh, gain it, oversight of what's happening. Uh, there are some things we can do simply by reforming contracting practices to ensure that we're not creating uh, monopolies in the hands of certain commanders, uh, to ensure that we're uh, restraining their behaviors. Um, and that's the sort of preliminary step. But in terms of transitioning, there is also the capacity uh, to rely on Afghan force structures eventually. I think once you start, if you take action to break down these uh, militias, that I think will at some point help recruitment in the ANA and ANP. Right now there's a competition between some of these private security com companies and ANA for recruitment. But, but other than taking them on militarily, how are you going to do that? Right. Uh, eventually we want the Afghan army and the Afghan police to be strong enough to provide security on these routes. And this, of course, will take some time. Uh, the United States' commitment to uh, generating the Afghan army is, is a long-term one. And I think we've only seen the industrial strength um, mentoring and partnership uh, sort of efforts start in the last six months. And I think we can hope that the pace at which we develop the Afghan army will accelerate past what we have seen in, seen in the past. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a sort of perplexing, you know, which comes first on that or whatever. Go ahead, Dr. Steyer. Well, I, I think the, there is some naivety here about well, can the Afghan army take over this function or not, or should it be put in the hands of other the U.S. forces and so on? Fact is, if it's put in the hands of U.S. forces, you've made every one of the people now doing it uh, active opponents. You, you've doubled the opposition, and they're effective because they know it from the inside. Uh, if you try to turn it over to the Afghan army, uh, this is a very slow and long-term project. It'll have much the same effect. It seems to me you have to look at the entire, fundamentally at the incentive structures. We've announced that we're leaving. It, it, it is not, in my judgment, uh, even if we are, it's not a prudent thing to publicize the way we have because everyone in the region, not just Afghanistan, set his watch. And you have a lot of people now who are involved in the security and trans transport businesses in Afghanistan making hay while the sun shines in any way they can. They don't see a future. We leave, this system collapses. They'd better have plenty of money in Dubai by then or they've lost their chance. What I'm suggesting is that we become the sponsors and well-wishers of, of, of normal trade and transport. And, and some of these guys will transition into it. Uh, how do you do that? It's not, it, it is partly uh, rhetorical. It's announcing it, saying publicly that that's our goal. But beyond that, it is, it is saying, yes, we're going to extend security to private trade. We're, we're, we're the same people. Well, when are you say extend security, doctor, you extend United States force security or contractor security? Uh, that I'll leave to the conclusion of the discussion. I think, however, that's something that the Afghan National Army could undertake tomorrow. And the protection of the road system, you think that they're prepared for to do that? private For private local trade, yes, because that would not involve foreign forces or even foreign money directly. I, I, my, my point is simply that if we are unable to offer anything in the way of a serious economic incentive to the local population to keep roads open, we will fail. And the only kind of solution that I uh, 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 can conceive that will meet that criterion is, is that we become the, uh, the, the sponsor of the open road. Well, we're going to wind this up because we really appreciate the time that you spent with us here this afternoon. But I do want to give any of you or all of you an opportunity for one last word if you feel compelled. Mr. Schwartz, pass. Mr. Forsberg, pass. pass. Colonel, pass. Dr. Starr. I'd like to return to what Mr. Flake said three times and which I think, Mr. Chairman, you said several times. This is a problem fundamentally not of tactics but of strategy. If we try to solve today's question on a mere tactical level, it won't work. It must be addressed on a strategic level. If you can come up with a better alternative 
economic strategy than I've proposed here. I think we should rush to embrace it. But we need one. We don't have one. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. It's great food for thought, and, and we appreciate the time and thoughtfulness you put into your testimony. Meeting is adjourned. We're joined by Bob Cusack, Managing Editor of The Hill. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Let's start off by talking about the congressional and uh, gubernatorial races happening around the country today. Mm -hmm. We're seeing some runoffs, some big contests.